Let's go back to the mid-1970s. In 1974, Larry McDonald won his seat in the Congress. This was the year that Newt Gingrich started running for Congress. It took him three tries before he finally made it. But 1974 was also the year when the incredibly subversive article, The Hard Road to World Order, was published in Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations. This article was written by CFR heavyweight Richard N. Gardner. It lamented that a single leap into world government wasn't possible, so he brazenly called for, quote, an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, end quote. He even stated that the end run approach could produce some remarkable concessions of sovereignty that could not be achieved on an across-the-board basis. Among the numerous recommendations to accomplish this end run, Gardner, as far back as 1974, remember, he called for disarmament programs, a UN military force, additional authority for the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, and new and broader enforcement powers to go along with membership in the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT. Now, no one from the Council on Foreign Relations has ever repudiated these explicit Gardner-authored attacks on national sovereignty. Instead, the CFR's journal has published other, less subtle assaults. But the overall goal remains the same. The Council on Foreign Relations wants to push the United States into a world government. And as many Americans have begun to discover, the CFR crowd has been getting its way for many, many years. So it came as little surprise to see the name Newton L. Gingrich, listed as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in the beginning of 1990. And this organization was founded in 1921 for the purpose of creating a world government and abolishing national independence. Jump ahead now to the fall of 1994, 20 years after the Gardner article in Foreign Affairs magazine. CFR member Gingrich's Republican Party has just won a huge victory in the 1994 congressional races. He's in line to be Speaker of the House. What does he do? He acquiesces in the convening of a lame duck session of Congress. Then he uses his considerable muscle to have Congress pass an important measure leading to the demise of this nation's sovereignty. Much deeper involvement for the United States in GATT. He has already helped to get NAFTA passed. In both of these efforts, he stood shoulder to shoulder with Bill Clinton, another member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Numerous congressmen and newly elected representatives said that anything as important to the United States as submitting to GATT's World Trade Organization shouldn't be decided by defeated congressmen in a lame duck session. They wanted any vote on the matter to be postponed until the new Congress convened in January of 1995. They said that the issue should be decided by the newly elected members of Congress who reflected the current attitude of the American people, which attitude had just resoundingly been registered in the congressional elections. Early in 1994, Newt Gingrich testified before the House Ways and Means Committee. Listen to what he said about the plan to expand GATT's powers. Quote, we need to be honest about the fact that we are transferring from the United States significant authority to a new organization. This is a transformational moment. This is not just another trade agreement. This is a very big transfer of power." End quote. This assessment of what was planned for GATT is absolutely correct. It's why the Council on Foreign Relations wanted the United States to submit to the trade bloc's regulatory powers. GATT has established a gigantic bureaucracy called the World Trade Organization, which is now the sole interpreter of 20,000 pages of trade regulations for 120 nations. This WTO essentially has life and death authority over America's economic interests. But the Constitution grants power to Congress and to Congress alone to regulate commerce with foreign nations. And Congress has no authority to delegate its powers to any other body. But with Newt Gingrich leading the way, GATT and its World Trade Organization have been given this power. We have also learned that GATT will meddle in such matters as reducing the amount of money U.S. citizens can put aside for pensions. 
A headline from the December 5, 1994 Wall Street Journal, the establishment newspaper that openly urged Congress to approve the GATT Accord. The headline reads, GATT Law to Reduce Amount Americans Can Save for Pensions. What are we to think when Newt Gingrich, the supposed alternative to a revolutionary Bill Clinton, joins the president in New Hampshire in June of 1995 for a love feast debate where not one of Mr. Clinton's many deficiencies were aired. Instead of using the nationally televised opportunity to point out the harmful policies being offered by the president and the reforms America really needs, Gingrich told the audience in Claremont, New Hampshire, that he was a big fan of Franklin Roosevelt and a big fan of Woodrow Wilson. This is an alternative to Bill Clinton. In March 1995, Gingrich gave a speech at the Nixon Center for Peace and Security. After praising himself for his role in the NAFTA and GATT measures, getting them through Congress, he told his audience that the United States must lead all over the world. His remarks caused The Economist to feature him in an article entitled The Internationalists. But he's not supposed to be an internationalist. He's supposed to be a defender of the independence of the United States. Hardly a day goes by without some attack in the media complaining about isolationism. And this is exactly the topic that the British article addressed in its revealing portrait of Gingrich. Here's what it said. If Mr. Clinton and Gingrich, as good internationalists, want to keep this isolation in check, they have work to do in their own parties. Strange as it may seem in these days of loud contrast politics, on this issue, they are actually on the same side. On January 20th, 1995, Secretary of State Warren Christopher delivered a foreign policy speech at Harvard University. After the speech, Christopher, who went from Vice Chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations into the Clinton Cabinet, was asked by a television reporter for his assessment of Newt Gingrich. His one-word answer, given with a wry smile, was internationalist. There are few who would know better than Warren Christopher the full meaning of that one-word description. But haven't traditional-minded Americans been told repeatedly that Gingrich is their champion? That he will always put America first? That he is a tough, no-nonsense American? That he will lead the revolution against big government? Sad to say, the facts speak otherwise, again and again. The CFR membership of Speaker Gingrich places him alongside President Clinton, Secretary of State Christopher, and over 500 other U.S. government officials who share membership in this seat of internationalist establishment power. In July 1995, the New York Times featured Gingrich in a front page article whose headline labeled him a foreign policy novice. But the Times delighted in pointing out that Gingrich's favorite foreign policy mentor is Henry Kissinger. It claimed that Kissinger is doing a good job schooling the speaker. Kissinger, the architect of much of America's disastrous foreign policy over recent years, is another member of the Council on Foreign Relations. It certainly follows that he is a huge promoter of international trade entanglements such as NAFTA and GATT, both backed by Newt Gingrich. Also in July 1995, Gingrich gave a speech at the Center for Strategic and International Affairs. In it, he said, quote, the American challenge in leading the world is compounded by our Constitution, end quote. He suggested that we would have to rethink our Constitution. He also told his audience, I believe in a very strong central government. You can have a very strong but limited federal government. No, you can't. The founders wanted the central government weak, not strong. It was to be tied down to merely protecting rights. In April 1996, President Clinton signed the new federal budget. While doing so, he repeatedly thanked congressional leaders, Speaker Gingrich and Senate Majority Leader Dole, for backing down and not scrapping an array of government programs that should be scrapped. He went out of his way to heap praise on these Republicans. He said he was pleased that Congress restored the programs, followed his urging regarding others, and adopted recommendations for some more. 
these programs, all of which were supposed to be terminated according to Gingrich, include oppressive environmental laws, the National Service Program, the United Nations inspired Goals 2000 program for America's schools, federal financing of local police, and UN peacekeeping missions for our nation's military. A very astute observer of American politics recently summarized the difficult situation facing good congressmen who seek re-election in 1996. Gingrich has achieved something almost unthinkable. He has kept Republican freshmen from being conservative and yet set them up for possible defeat in November for being too conservative. That takes brilliance. Early in 1996, freshman Republican Congressman John Hostetler of Indiana wrote a letter to Gingrich and released it to the press. It said, I am today declining your unsolicited office to, att to attend a fundraiser in southwestern Indiana to benefit my reelection. Hostetler felt he was better off getting ready for re-election on his own than having Gingrich by his side. And that attitude has spread amongst the very best of the Republicans in the House. Not only did Gingrich use his brilliance to keep Republican freshmen from being conservative, some of the best Republican conservatives turned down his support for their re-election. In the revealing case of Dr. Ron Paul, who in 1996 sought to regain a seat in Congress after having a decade of not serving, Newt Gingrich did everything possible to keep him from returning to Washington. Gingrich went out of his way to get 50 members of Congress to endorse Dr. Paul's opponent in the Texas primary. Even former President George H.W. Bush campaigned for Dr. Paul's opponent at Gingrich's request. Despite all of Gingrich's efforts, Dr. Paul did win the primary and the election and did return to Congress. Why would the supposed leader of the conservative movement work to keep one of the Constitution's most stalwart defenders away from Washington, D.C.? The answer is that Gingrich is one of many who want to be known as a conservative, an undefined and shifting attitude. Many so-called conservatives today don't care to be reminded that there really is a constitution that limits government power. Dr. Paul is more a constitutionalist than a conservative. Congressmen who do care about the constitution have been complaining about being called on the carpet by Gingrich for disloyalty. Disloyalty to what? Not to the constitution, but to the party and to the leadership of the party. Was the Constitution ever mentioned? Not on your life. Americans have been talked out of the Constitution and its limitations on government power. Repeatedly, we are expected to make judgments based on someone being labeled either conservative or liberal, terms that are not defined. Today, a man with a record like Gingrich's can be described as a conservative. Henry Kissinger has announced that he's a conservative. You get an idea of how much substance this term conveys after examining the records of those whom the media brands conservative and keeps telling us that they are conservatives. In truth, the term conservative has been co-opted by big government, by New World Order advocates, and by closet socialists. We hear a great deal of talk in our country today about the need to balance the federal budget. Right now, the accumulated national debt exceeds $5 trillion. It costs $300 billion per year for interest. So what do our leaders propose? Democrat and Republican leaders tell us they plan to balance the budget in seven years. This means that for at least six more years, they plan to add to the national debt and to the interest bill borne by the taxpayers. The John Birch Society believes that the budget can be balanced in a matter of months. Two very easily understood steps would get the job done. First step, terminate all foreign aid, including Mexican-style bailouts. All of it is completely unconstitutional to begin with, and it hardly makes sense for a nation so heavily indebted as ours to be giving away money. And the second step would be to bring the troops home. 
Why should we be absorbing the defense budget for Japan and South Korea and Germany and Italy and so many other countries? Bring the troops home and restate that their sole mission is the protection of the life, liberty, and property of the American people. Some will call that isolationism, but I'm not an isolationist and I don't think you are either. What are we? We're non-interventionists with the sons and the daughters and the wallets of the American people. 